Trees make a lot of difference, both in the real world as well as in miniature. However, it is often grossly overlooked by many while making a model. So today I'll show you how you can build the ultimate miniature tree for your diorama or model railroad that looks brilliant even under 3x magnification. This is a long process with quite a few steps, so without further ado, let's get started. My starting point is a bunch of 30 gauge florist wire. Any type of soft and malleable wire can be used, but florist wire has a covering of thin layer of paper which is helpful to add more layers on top of it. The size of the tree and the thickness of the trunk dictate how many wires should be there in the bunch. Bigger trees and thicker trunk means more wire. Next, I take a discarded piece of multi-strand electrical wire. I strip it and then cut various lengths of the wire. These very thin strands will be used to make small branches and twigs. I prefer real life prototypes for my models and trees are no different. The tree I have in mind is called Mohua or Madhuka longifolia which is a semi-deciduous tree that is found in many parts of India. Along with a Google image search, authentic botanical references are extremely useful if you can find them on the internet. Once I have a general idea of the shape and size of the tree, I leave about 10% of the length of the bunch and start twisting. These will create the visible roots of the tree. I start by taking a few wires and twist them together to form the roots. Notice that I'm spreading the wires initially in a V or fan shape. This is important to get a tighter twist. To vary the thickness of the individual roots, I change the number of wires I use for a particular branch. For thicker roots, I split it halfway to make branching in the root and repeat the steps till I reach the last possible fork in that root. Now, making the main branches. I start from the lowest one by grabbing a bunch approximately an inch and a half above the base. I split the bunch in two equal parts, spread them in V-shape and start twisting. I twist about 3 cm and leave the two halves to make sub-branches later. For the main trunk, I decide to add a few more wires to keep the consistency in thickness and twist them tightly. I continue the process for the rest of the main branches. Then I position the main branches in the desired orientations. I start the same process for smaller branches diverging from the main ones. Notice that at this stage it is helpful to spread everything wide so that the wires of different branches don't get entangled. If you are making a wire tree then at this stage you need to start thinking about the overall shape and size of the tree. I am making a medium-sized tree in HO scale which can pass as a big tree in N scale. I want uniform elliptical canopy and dense branches. To achieve the required density, I loop the remaining ends of the wires back to the point where I split them from the mother branch and twist this loop. When you cut the loop, you get more branches. Sometimes I extend the open end of the loop beyond the point of divergence to make one more branch so that I get three branches instead of two from the same set of wires. Next step, small branches and twigs. I cut the last loops using my nipper to get open-ended wires at the end of a branch. I secure the tree on my cutting mat using blue tack and take two or three strand of small copper wire and insert them between the pair of florist wires. 
I twist the florist wires tightly and after a couple of turns, I add more copper wires on the same branch. I do this at a time for one set of small branches. Then I take two pairs of tweezers and start twisting these copper wires. The principle is the same, except most of the times I need to give one additional twist around the florist wires for strength and stability of these twigs. I leave the ends free. Copper being a soft metal, the twisting automatically gives them an irregular twist shape that you expect to see in small branches and twigs. Now I'm at a stage where I can start giving the tree its desired shape. For this, I take a printout of a mahua tree and place it in front of me. Then I start positioning the branches to bring my tree as close to the photo as I can. It doesn't have to be exactly like the example. The photograph is meant to be a guide rather than a template. Once the overall shape is achieved, I do some fine tuning by separating entangled twigs and branches. After spending around 8 hours, spanning over 3 days, twisting and turning wires, I have what I want. As crazy as it looks at this point, I still have a long way to go. Next step is to apply a binder and the base layer. For this, I use basic emulsion paint, a technique I learned from master model maker Vikas Chander. If you haven't seen his work, click the link to his channel in the description below. I highly recommend that you take a look. This part is messy, so I lay a couple of drafting papers to cover the tabletop and protect it from paint spillage. I take a medium-sized food container and thin the paint about 50% with tap water so that it flows better through the tiny branches and little nooks and crannies. I stick a toothpick through the bottom of the tree as a handle. Then I dip the top part of the tree in the liquid and take a straw to blow the excess off. I make sure to dip the tree in different orientation till all the branches get an even coat while I continue to blow the excess off with the straw. Once done with the branches, I remove the handle and dip the main trunk and the roots in the liquid. Then I hang the tree to dry. Notice that the excess paint flows downward and creates blobs at the end of the branches. I continue to use the straw to blow all the excess paint off to ensure there is no unnatural blob or accumulation anywhere. Next item to enter the stage is modeling paste. An acrylic based soft sculpting material that is water soluble and very easy to work with. I take a little bit of the paste in a small bowl and thin it about 70% with tap water. Then I take a soft bristle brush and start applying it on the top branches. The objective here is to cover the twisty look of the wires. You hardly see real trees where the branches look like made of twisted wires. I dab the paste on the branches, focusing on the crevices to even out the surface. In the end, it should look like one solid piece without any trace of wires underneath. If you're using this material, then keep in mind that as the water evaporates, the paste will shrink and might expose the wires again. So it is a good idea to apply a little more than what you think is needed. Overdoing has some benefit in this rare occasion. For the trunk and the main branches, I apply the undiluted paste directly on the surface. Note that I'm applying the paste liberally. First, I dab the paste in nooks and crannies to smoothen the surface. Then, I make very light downward strokes to make slight unevenness that you see in real tree trunks. I also add thick veins at the transition from the trunk to the roots.
finally, I have a beautiful white tree which looks fabulous in its own rights. As dense as it looks at this point, it is still not dense enough compared to a real tree. To make finer twigs and stems for the leaves, I took some white polyfiber. Now, you can use the Woodland Scenics polyfiber if you have them, but I like my polyfibers fresh. So I outsourced the job of harvesting them to my four-legged sidekick, Strider. He always keeps up a steady supply by systematically disemboweling all the evil stuff toys. I take a pair of scissors and start trimming the clump like a wannabe hairdresser. Smaller the pieces, the better. I bring out my trusted heavy-duty hair gel and spray on the branches after hanging the tree upside down. I sprinkle the tiny fibers on the underside of the branches, then I sprinkle the fiber from the top. Just like applying leaves, I made sure to avoid the main trunks and the branches and focused on applying the fiber on the smaller branches and twigs. After every round, I shook the tree to shed the excess and then recycle the excess for next round of application. It is impossible to avoid the main branches and the trunk, so I take a hard bristle brush to remove any stray fibers from places where I don't want them. At the end of this step, I have a tree that seems to have the right density of twigs and stems. As I entered the painting phase, the first step is to use a primer. And for this, I chose flat gray spray primer. It is applied thoroughly on the tree and is left for drying. In the meantime, I decide on the color scheme, a straightforward gray and brown combination. I'm using chalk paint to bring that muted matte finish in every layer. Mohoa bark is deep gray in color with intricate cracks when matured. I decide to handle the cracks later and as the first coat I made dark gray shade by mixing black and light gray. I am using an airbrush for this, so I dilute the paint about 40% and add a few drops of isopropyl alcohol to improve the flow. I paint the major branches and trunks in this dark gray color at about 30 psi. For the smaller branches and twigs, I decide to go for brown. Again, I dilute the paint about 40% and add a few drops of isopropyl alcohol and then airbrush all the twigs and the branches. The gray primer helps transition this color well from the dark gray color in the bigger branches. For the cracks in the matured parts of the tree, I selected one step crackle medium. First I apply an even coat on the dark grey portion of the trunk and let the medium dry. Next I make a relatively lighter grey mix using light grey and black and airbrush it on top of the dark grey portions. The idea is that as the paint dries, it will create the crackle effect and the darker bark below will show through those cracks. However, even after a whole night of drying, there are no cracks to be seen. At that point, I had no clue what went wrong and frustrated cursing filled the air, understandably. I later realized that because I airbrushed the paint, the layer was too even and thin for the crackling to happen. So, if you're planning to use this method, make sure to use a thicker layer of paint and a paintbrush. At this point, I have two choices. First, leave it as is and move on, because even without the cracks, the trunk looks very nice and can easily pass as a smooth bark tree. Second, give another go at getting the crackling effect. Do you want to guess which path I chose? Enter crackle paste. The tried and tested method of crackling when everything else fails. Yes, the frustratingly stubborn and headstrong monster in me won the battle.
I took a soft bristle brush and applied the paste on all matured parts of the tree. There is no question that this is going back several steps. This could have been done at the stage where I applied the modeling paste. The decision, however, pays off as the crackling effect starts appearing even before I finish applying the paste on the tree. Once the paste dried and cracks appeared on the bark, first I apply a black wash to accentuate the cracks. Then I take my four colors on the palette to start dry brushing. What works best for dry brushing is the hard bristle makeup brush. But for areas that require precise application, I use a Humbrol fine brush. Notice that I'm using shades of brown to show the reddish brown inner bark, a nice effect to bring more realism. I add another layer of the crackling paste in selected areas of the main trunk to accentuate the cracks and create layers of bark. I repeat the steps of the black wash and dry brushing to achieve desired effects. Watch how I am mixing the four colors, two shades of brown, light gray, and black to bring subtle variations in color throughout the tree. To give the whole tree a rough texture, I take some brown spray paint and spray the twigs and branches from about 18 inches afar. Notice that the paint is almost dry as it hits the branches and thus will leave a rough texture on the surface. I repeat the same step with light gray to add some highlights. The final step of painting is blending all the colors with some light airbrushing. I mostly use shades of brown and sometimes gray to make sure that the different colors are blended well and there is no sharp or unnatural spike of any particular shade. It required patience and there was a major setback, but I finally achieved what I wanted. The crackling effect, the rough texture of the bark, mix of different shades just the way it should be. A part of me wanted to stop at this stage and leave the tree as is to celebrate the intricate details, but I was also curious to see how leaves add a new dimension to this beautiful tree. It's time to enter the final act, leaves. Looking at the reference image, you can see that there is one major branch that has mostly dried leaves. I take this as an inspiration to add more color and variety to the model. So one major portion of the tree will have mostly semi-dried leaves, while others will have green leaves. Also, I decided to add some young leaves in this part of the tree as well. Young leaves in this type of tree has a deep rust color, which often resembles the rust color of dried leaves, except these leaves are shinier. Nothing looks better as dried leaves than dried leaves. So I take a dried almond leaf, that still has some green left and grind it thoroughly in a kitchen grinder. Once done, I use a fine sieve to separate out the fine particles to be used for other projects. Mohua tree has medium sized leaves, so I choose leaves that are about 1 to 1.5 millimeter in size. For the rest of the leaves, I turn to my collection of knock leaves of various colors. I spray the branches with hairspray and then sprinkle the leaves on the branches. I also add two shades of the rust color knock leaves that can denote both young and old leaves. Green leaves are also added sparingly to bring variety. Once the dry and colorful leaves are done, I move to green leaves. I use knock medium and light green leaves for the rest of the tree. 
To speed up the process, I use hairspray on the branches and then dab on the medium green leaves stored in a container. I shake the tree immediately to remove any excess. Then I sprinkle some light green leaves to add some highlights. For isolated twigs and stems, I add some diluted matte medium and sprinkle some leaves so that they fall exactly on these branches. This targeted application and those one-off isolated twigs with leaves are a real differentiator in achieving the fine scale appearance. Here, taking a different approach, I spray the hairspray and then take a finger full of leaves and dab them on the branches. From time to time, it is required to remove the leaves from unwanted places before the glue dries. I continue with the same steps till the leaves are well distributed throughout the tree. Notice that I intentionally vary the density of the leaves. Some parts of the tree have more exposed branches and twigs than the other. I also added some rust color leaves sparingly in some parts of the tree to simulate young leaves. It is important to break patterns consciously, add layers and blend colors to replicate nature convincingly. Finally, it is time to seal everything with an even coat of testers talcoat lacquer. There you have it, a tree that took over 12 hours to build and is worth every minute of it. Of course, it would have taken me much less time to do this if the crackling setback didn't happen. Moreover, the camera not only adds 10 pounds, it also adds a lot of hours. Now, you might be thinking that this is a lot of work for a tree, and I agree. You don't make 300 of these. If you're building a model train layout, then you make these only for your main scenes and place them at the foreground of your model. For a diorama where you need just one or two trees, you most likely won't mind spending a little more time for a tree that will draw every viewer's attention. Consider this as a fine scale model. And just like a fine scale building or a scene, patience and time is the key to success. I used very similar techniques to make this banyan tree as well, and clearly these trees are worth all the effort. So will you ever attempt building a tree like this? Which of the techniques you saw here would you try in your own model? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're wondering about a way to make a highly detailed forest as opposed to a single tree, I have some good news. The very next episode will be about making a lot of trees without sacrificing details. These trees and bushes can comfortably complement a highly detailed tree like this one. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you can stay up to date about all the upcoming releases. Until next time, happy modeling.